Okay. So what we have to do next is let's discuss the hermeticity or unitarity properties of these new transformations that we have worked out in the spinor space. Let me consider these two specific ones, uh, S3. For instance, there is no need to go any, f any further to the highest or most general form. S3 is sufficient. Now if you look at the The Hermitian conjugate of this, as sigma 3 is a unitary, sorry, Hermitian operator, as there is an i in here, so it becomes S inverse. Right? Or if you want, you can write it in the following fashion. So these, I, I, I'm doing it for third, the third rotation only, but obviously it is valid for all the other rotations or even a rotation about arbitrary direction because if you take n being a unit vector n dot s vector then it's again Hermitian therefore the associated s is unitary. So rotations are unitary. Rotations in the spinor space of course, right? Rotations in the spinor space are unitary. Whereas boosts are not, boosts are uh, sort of uh, strange. Well, they're not that strange, they are good, but in, in this context, because we are used to the fact that all the symmetry transformations are represented by unitary transformations. Is it? Perhaps not. Let's see. As of lambda k1, for instance, we have shown that it was omega alpha x, right? One. There is no i, it's one. So if we take the e Hermitian conjugate of this, we see that alpha is Hermitian, therefore it is equal to itself. Strange. So they are Hermitian, not unitary. Pure boosts, boosts are Hermitian, but not unitary. That's a bit annoying at first sight. As I said, all the transformations are represented, mostly, most of it. It's a common wisdom that they are represented by the unitary transformations, but boosts are not, strangely enough. So uh, let's see whether we can generalize this unitary uh, property to a more generalized, extended version of unitarity. For that, I will take these transformations and sandwich them between two gamma zeros. For instance, so let me use a shorthand notation of calling them rotations, okay, R meaning rotations and SB meaning boosts. Instead of writing the entire thing in a complicated manner, let me consider those rotations and a particularly ex particular example is this one, instead of taking the, the most general form. So if I take this and sandwich it between two gamma zeros, what do I get? Gamma zero e to the i over theta sigma three gamma zero. Now, what, how do I carry out this uh, operation? I expand. For each term, I sandwich gamma zero. 
The, the first term is one. So gamma zero, one, gamma zero, gamma zero squared is identity. So the first term is just one. What about the second term? Second term involves sigma three. Gamma zero, sigma three, gamma zero. Sigma trees are commutators of two space gammas, right? And if you jump gamma zero over two space gammas, minus and minus, then gamma zero squared is one. So plus, nothing changes. Therefore, then I resum. I expand, carry out the operation, and resum. So I get itself. That is, I get SR. Okay. Then I, I do this for the following. Consider now SR dagger. That's, you, some of you may think it's a tautology. In some sense, yes, but we are going to get something nice. So if I take SR dagger, again, Sandwich gamma zero, what do I get? It is the same thing, right? You expand, and the, uh, whether it's SR dagger or SR doesn't matter. There are, is, in it, there are a sigma three, and sigma three is the commutator of two space sigmas. Gamma zero jump over it without changing anything. So it is SR dagger. But we know that SR dagger was minus one to start with by the very definition. As I said, that is the portion perhaps you may think, isn't that a sort of a circular argument? Circular, but very nice argument. Let's keep this argument. So I found that if you take the Hermitian conjugate of the rotation uh, operator in the spinor space and sandwich it between two gamma zeros, you get the inverse. You say, actually, you get the inverse directly, and sandwiching it between gamma zeros doesn't change anything. That's why you seem to be getting, yes, that's true. But this expression is correct. Well, so for the rotation part, this is a trivial verification. But let me consider the boosts now. S boost. Now let me take the, start with the dagger of it, and sandwich it between two gamma zero Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, boost, boost. Now what was the boost? Boost was this one, for instance. You take the dagger, alpha is her mission, it's the same. Sandwich it between two gamma zero. How do you do that? Expand this, one plus linear alpha x, alpha x squared. So there are either ones or alpha x, right? As we have worked out explicitly. In this expansion, identity, times numbers, alpha x times numbers. One, the identity part of it, gamma zero, gamma zero is white identity. The second part, alpha x, gamma zero jumps over and gives you minus gamma zero from right, alpha x is equal to minus alpha x, minus gamma zero, alpha x, gamma zero, gamma zero identity. So when you sandwich gamma zero, alpha x, gamma zero, you get minus alpha x. Identity and alpha x. So what is it? It's the inverse, right? Alpha x changes sign, alpha x changing sign, meaning that just the minus of it. Oh, how nice. Then this is non-trivial part. The first one is trivial. So we have these two relations valid for both the rotation class and the boost class. So I can really drop the index and say, independent of its specific nature, that either it is boost or rotation, independent of that, the general S satisfies the following property. I will call this the sort of following Bjorken and Drell generalized unitarity. It is not the unitarity in the narrow sense, it is unitarity in this context. 
it's going to buy us several things. It's, it's an important relationship and you will see that it will play a crucial role in, for instance, in the definition of the psi bar. Okay, let me define the psi bar and then let's make use of this relationship which is very nice. I define this as the conjugate. This is a row, right? Because this one is a row. Psi 1 star, psi 2 star, psi 3 star, psi 4 star times gamma 0. So this is the definition. Instead of the psi dagger, I consider the psi bar together with the gamma 0, meaning really, if you really think of it, and as we will see discrete symmetries later, so the negative energy portions of the spinner, not only conjugated, they are also the signs are reversed. The psi bar is that kind of spinner. Okay, so what is the advantage of this new notation? Let me elaborate in the context of that generalized unitarity. So we see that the transformation is the following, right? Psi prime is S psi. How about the psi dagger? How do they transform? Psi dagger goes to psi dagger prime, which is psi dagger S dagger. Well, actually it is not that aesthetic. Uh, having the S dagger in the right hand side, we know that S dagger is sometimes S inverse, sometimes not S inverse. But S inverse is well defined, right? It is the inverse of an operator. You multiply the inverse operator with itself, you get identity. But S dagger is not that clean. Sometimes it's inverse, sometimes it is itself. So to clean up that sort of mathematical discomfort, I don't want to call it ambiguity, discomfort, so I say, let me transform this in the new thing that I defined, which is equal to psi dagger gamma zero. So it is transformed at psi dagger prime times gamma zero, which is psi dagger S dagger gamma zero. You may say, so what? Well, so what is the following? We have S dagger gamma zero here. When I multiply this further with the gamma zero from the left, S dagger gamma zero becomes gamma zero S inverse. So this one is equal to psi dagger gamma zero, put them together as inverse, psi bar as inverse. You see independent whether it's, it is rotation or pure boost, it doesn't matter. These psi bars transform nicely. Psi goes to S times, psi bar goes to psi bar times S inverse from the right, no ambiguity. So that's the advantage of this notation. You'll see, I'm going to use that extensively. Okay. Once that is understood, let's pursue the discussion further. Now it come, I come to the covariance of the continuity equation business, a very important business. Covariance issue. Remember, we had a continuity equation. Let me remind you, that was sort of an important step in the construction of the Dirac equation. What was it? D by dt psi dagger psi. Well, no, let me use shorthand instead of writing everything explicitly. This equation was immediately proven to be 
valid after we constructed the Dirac equation, so that rho was psi dagger psi, and j was psi dagger c alpha psi. It was satisfied. Being a total divergence, when I integrate overall space, the integral of, of, of a divergence overall space using the Gauss's theorem vanishes, and you get the then d by d t. I have a warning. When I look at the exam papers, I see that the partial derivative and straight derivatives are mixed up. It's not an innocent mistake, you know, it's a serious mistake. Please be careful about this. partial derivative and straight derivative. That equation leads to this, so you normalize and normalization is preserved. Continuity equation is vitally important for quantum mechanics in the context of probabilistic interpretation. Okay, there rho is psi dagger psi. Psi is a spinor, so psi dagger psi is not an ordinary C number or scalar, although you get a, a, a sum of psi 1 mod squared, etc. We claim that that's not a, a scalar. Why? Because this equation suggested us that there is a derivative d by dt and there is a space e, co the divergence of a vector-like thing. Therefore, if this thing is to have a meaning in all frames, the same meaning, which I mean covariance, then of course if you have a conservation of probability in one frame, you are going to have the conservation of the probability in another frame. Therefore, this thing is not a scalar, but the zeroth component of a four vector, and this is indeed the space part of a four vector. Are, is, are these things true? Well, let's demonstrate that these things are really true. Although they are more or less implicit in everything I was saying, so let me consider the following four vector. Consider now. When no indices, it means four vector, right? No arrows or anything. C, psi dagger of x, gamma zero, gamma psi of x. I said it's a four vector, but you say, how do you know? Is this a four vector? Well, everything, all these terminologies have a well-defined meaning. If it is a four vector, it should transform under Lorentz transformation like x mu. If it transforms like x super mu, then I can call it a four vector. Let's demonstrate that it indeed transforms like a four vector. Question then, is j mu a four vector? The answer is yes. And how do we demonstrate that the answer is yes? What we do is we just, this is in the unprimed frame, I go to the primed frame and I try to re relate this un primed frame expression to the unprimed frame expression and see whether it's the lambda mu nu times the original one. If so, like the x mu itself. Okay. J mu prime of x prime is C times psi prime of x prime gamma zero gamma mu psi prime of, that's the dagger of x prime, right? That's the expression in the prime frame. So let me put the transformations in S of psi of x, S is a matrix in the spinor space, and this one is psi dagger of x, S dagger. So, C 
c times psi dagger of x s dagger gamma zero gamma mu s psi of x. Oh, it looks ugly, doesn't it? Well, it looks ugly till we remember to use that beautiful transformation. It says s dagger gamma zero is gamma zero times s inverse, right there. You multiply from both sides, from gamma zero from left, you get this. Once you get this, what is this then? Gamma zero, S inverse, gamma mu, S. You see how beautiful this algebra is really. Once you catch S inverse, gamma mu, S, what is this? Lambda mu nu, gamma nu. Isn't it? Then I take it out, lambda mu nu times C psi dagger of x, gamma zero, gamma nu psi of x. What is this? This is the unprimed frame expression. So J mu prime of x prime is equal to lambda mu nu times J nu. Exactly like the four vector itself, right? Remember, compare against x mu prime is, or x mu prime is lambda mu nu x nu. So this j nu I defined, this new quantity I defined is nothing but a four vector. It indeed transforms like a four vector under Lorentz transformations. Is this really what I have in this continuity equation? Or if I formulate the question in a more clear manner, are the components of this four vector, the rho and the j I had identified before for the Dirac equation? It is more or less a trivial matter. Let's see the components of this j mu. Let me work out the components and demonstrate that indeed they are the Dirac probability density and the, the current density. What is the J0 I read there? J0 of x is C psi dagger gamma 0 gamma 0 psi. Hmm? Gamma 0 was there. This, this is the is the zeroth component of the gamma mu. And this is the identity gamma 0 squared. So I have C psi dagger psi or c times rho. The rho I had before is when I multiply that rho with the c, I get the zeroth component of this new four vector. What about the space component? I of x c psi dagger gamma zero gamma i psi Gamma zero times gamma i. What was gamma super i? It is gamma zero times alpha i. Remember, for the alpha, the indices are all down, all Cartesian. <coughs> but gamma zero times gamma zero is gamma zero squared, which is one. So this is c psi dagger alpha i psi. This is indeed what I had, right? We have identified by construction. We have started the Dirac from the Dirac equation and constructed this one, and that was the J of the Dirac. So this J mu is really the four vector. So if I need really look at the following, dJ mu by dx mu, what is this? dJ zero, dx zero, plus dJi, dxi, right? Some of our repeated indices are understood. Dj0, what is this? D of C rho, D of Ct. Nicely, because J0 is containing that extra C, which is going to cancel the C in the denominator. So D rho dt times divergence of. Nice indeed. So even the equation is verified. 
Can I prove the covariance of this equation in general? As these are really showing that it's covariant, right? Well, being the d mu j mu, it's invariant, but if, whether it's covariant furthermore, it has the same form. So what I have to do is look at this derivative now, divergence equation, and in the primed frame and unprimed frame show that they are equal. Then as it is zero, it is going to be zero both. But having the same form is the first step. Having the same form and the value being zero means invariant, not only covariant, invariant. Covariance and invariance are obviously subtly different, right, from each other. Okay, let me demonstrate that now. d j mu prime x prime divided by d x prime mu in the prime frame. So I write this as d d x prime mu times j mu prime x prime, which I know to be mu nu j nu of x. Well, this is these are constants. Not de do not, they do not depend on the point, otherwise it would be a nonlinear transformation. Therefore, this should jump and act on it, but you say, stop. This is a function of x, this is a function of x prime, so I have to convert the derivative as well. How do I do that? Well, we have the beautiful set of, well, let me write the transformation, x prime mu lambda mu nu x nu, and let me go to the infinitesimal case, as these are linear. Okay. So, let's use the chain rule to convert this. d dx prime mu is d dx rho dx rho dx prime mu, right? repeated indices are summed. I'm not putting the summation sign. So there is this Jacobian, correct? And the, indeed, correctly, I have converted into x variables. How do I compute that Jacobian? If I go dx prime by dx, it is lambda. But I need the inverse transformation, no? There. So let me write the inverse transformation, and then let's compute the Jacobian accordingly. So if I now write the dx, mu lambda inverse mu nu dx prime nu. Can I? Is this the inverse? Indeed, it's the inverse, right? If x prime is equal to matrix notation lambda times x, x is equal to lambda inverse times x prime, and you take the differentiation, you get this. Is it in the right form? It's in the right form, because I need dx rho by dx prime mu. Okay, so let me use the index accordingly. dx rho, dx prime mu. Then this is mu and this is nu. That's mu nu. Then it is lambda inverse rho mu. You just follow the indices. So this Jacobian here is computed already. So let me take this and substitute in here. So what do I have? Lambda inverse rho mu d d x rho. Then I can rewrite, but I have to do it. I will do it if you permit me instead of, I cannot copy it. Okay, I'll do next, next. So dj, dj mu prime x prime divided by dx prime mu is lambda mu nu, lambda mu nu there already. Okay, so dx prime mu is x minus, here, the x prime mu is lambda inverse rho mu times 
times the x row times j nu of x. What is this? Lambda inverse times lambda times rho nu. Right? Matrix multiplication, tensor root contraction. Which is identity. So this is delta this is equal to delta rho nu. Delta rho nu. Primed for divergence of that four current is equal to unprimed for divergence of the four current. So it's covariant. It has the same form in all frames. Furthermore, it's zero. Okay. So if with the help of that new uh, new definition of cybar. And the J mu has a simpler form, C psi bar gamma mu psi. Why do I say so? Because it was psi dagger and gamma zero, that the original definition. So I use the psi, definition of the psi bar combining psi dagger and gamma zero. We have C psi bar gamma mu psi, which transforms like a four vector. So these are called vector currents and they are used heavily in the co construction of actions of several interactions, etc. Now the next step in principle I should have perhaps wanted to start that in at the beginning of a new cloud but let me continue because we are running out of time. We have only one week left. So let me move into space reflection. Till now I have been talking about proper Lorentz transformations, which have two classes, pure boosts and pure rotations. They are proper because they have the determinant plus one. But the invariance of the interval allows us to have two possible signs for the determinant, as I have demonstrated last time. Determinant could be plus one and minus one. The plus one class are these uh, proper Lorentz transformations, rotations and boosts. And what is the advantage of being proper that determined being plus one? You can start with the infinitesimal ones and then exponentiate or integrate whichever terminology you like to get to finite forms. But the improper ones are those with determinant minus one and those cannot, those are of a different class. And we have well-defined examples of parity, space reflection, not changing the time, just reversing the space coordinate. And time reversal, change, not changing the space part, but reversing the sign of time. And then uh, other discrete symmetries like charge conjugation which takes you from particle to antiparticle, and then you combine all these two, C, P, and T, charge conjugation and space reflection times the time reversal, it is a beautiful theorem, CPT theorem, which nowadays not, uh, uh, nobody has managed to demonstrate that it is broken, it's an invariant. Some people, those axiomatists are constructing field theories based on, one, based on symmetry principles. One of the symmetry principles is the CPT. Charge conjugation times parity and time reversal is a, a beautiful symmetry of the world, really. I'm not going to have any time, uh, well obviously we are not going to have, we, are, we don't have much time left for to do any further things, but it could have been nice if we had the opportunity to discuss charge conjugation because that's the actual relationship between a particle and antiparticle. Well, we have seen that there are negative energy solutions because energy momentum dispersion relation has negative energy 
a possibility. So whether those negative energies are indeed the antiparticles of the known particles, that's the subject of discussion in the, under the charge conjugation. That you go from the electron to positron, for instance, then you go to negative energy, and then not only negative energy, you do other things, in which, which enables you to identify as the antiparticle having the same mass, opposite charges, and negative energy is negative. And some people like Feynman has interpreted them as positive energy objects moving in the reverse direction of time, etc. There's a beautiful physics there, and it's one of the most important fields of research in high energy physics, CP violation. Right? And somebody someday will get a new Nobel Prize when they understand the very origin of matter, antimatter, asymmetry of the universe, although we have started with the symmetric regime at the Big Bang, as time evolved, matter dominated by a factor of 10 to the 9 over the antimatter. And how that happened? What is the source of the CP violation? As I said, it's a beautiful physics in there. Some of you may continue along those lines in your research eventually. But let me now work out a very simple form, parity, space reflection. It's easier to discuss. Space reflection. What kind of transformation that is? You go from x to x prime Cartesian, which is equal to minus of the x. And t goes to t prime, which is equal to t. So if I really write the x mu in the matrix notation as x0, x1, x2, and x3, OK, that's the, the representation of the x mu in the matrix notation. So under this p, it goes to x prime, which is x0 minus x1 minus x2 minus x3. How this one is related to the original one? If I take this and multiply it with the following 1 minus 1 and minus 1 and minus 1 times x0, x1, x2 and x3, isn't it? That's really the transformation. It looks very much like G mu nu. But I don't want to write it G mu nu, although uh, my former teachers are writing it. That's dangerous. It's not. G mu nu has a well-defined meaning in matrix notation. The two indices must be down or up. If you have two indices up or down, then your uh, tensor contraction rule is violated. It's hurt. I don't want to hurt the tensor uh, the transformation rule. So I write it in the following fashion. I say this one is then x mu prime is lambda parity mu nu x nu. That's a safe notation. And this matrix is that matrix. But it is with the mu up, nu down, not g mu nu down or g mu nu up. You see the subtlety? Why well, I, I hesitate. I avoid really writing it as g mu nu. I don't have to, because we don't really need to do that. Now let's work out the covariance issue. And what is the, for example, the S, what is the S of lambda p? The parity transformation in the spin or space, right? That's the question. If this is the lambda p, what is the corresponding S? Well, it, the underlying structure is covariance. We, what we have to have uh, in the unprimed and prime frame, as far as the parity transformations are concerned, the equation should have the same form, covariance. In this new transformed frame, it should, we should have still the covariance. It's a free particle. There is nothing which violates the covariance. So what is the covariance equation satisfied by the S's? It is the same as before. It was demonstrated for Lorentz transformations proper. Now it is the Lorentz transformations improper. 
determinant minus one. It's the LP, lambda p. That is S inverse of lambda p times gamma mu S of lambda p should be equal to lambda p times mu nu gamma nu. That's the covariance condition. I, I'm not doing much. I'm just rewriting the uh, covariance equation with that extra specific lambda p. In order to avoid the ambiguity again with the you know, com summation convention, let me work out the zeroth component and space component separately. What is the zeroth component? S inverse. Now put the p as a shorthand. Instead of writing S of lambda p, I will write S sub p, saying that it's a spinorial transformation associated with the parity. Okay. S inverse p, gamma zero, S p, is lambda zero, nu, gamma nu. If this is the zero, only the other component is must be zero because it's zero, zero, one, one, two, two, three, three, non-zeros. So I have gamma zero. If I go to the space component now, sp gamma i sp is minus gamma i. I will write the new equations and we'll stop because we cannot finish it today. We'll do it next week. But the equation is, the, the, I can write them in the following equivalent forms. That is, I have two equations satisfied by the SP. I will solve that equation. What is it? The first one gives you the commutator of SP gamma zero is zero. Well, how do I get that? You multiply this with the SP from left. You have gamma zero SP and SP gamma zero. Move it to the next, so you get a commutator. And for this one, you get anti-commutator, again repeating the same. S P for any gamma i is equal to zero. It must be a four by four matrix in the S space. What is the matrix which satisfy that, uh, that relationship? Something which anti-commutes with the space part and commutes with gamma zero itself. It's gamma zero times a constant. Okay, I will stop in here to continue later. So that's the parity transformation in the spinor space.